Mark Finio's Best of the Independent Series. Our guest today is Reckless Youth. What is your earliest memory of in wrestling? Uh, I can remember when I was really young, uh, going over to a friend's house, and uh, he he was watching uh, Hulk Hogan vs. Iron Sheik on uh, old WWF TV, and that's probably the first match I ever saw. And I saw you know Hulk Hogan win the belt and everything, so that was probably my first memory with wrestling. Uh, what are your thoughts on backyard wrestling? Uh, that's kind of like where I came from. So, I mean, I used to backyard wrestle uh, for years. I, I probably, I used to wrestle in my high school, like in, the, in our back wrestling gym with all my friends. And that's how we kind of got started. And then we started backyard wrestling. I did that for probably four, four years, something like that. And uh, before I actually got into a wrestling ring. So, uh, I, I mean, my big thing with backyard wrestling is that I don't think there's any problem with it because most of the guys in wrestling, uh, that's where they came from. They you know, were backyard wrestlers. Uh, I just think that they should, you know, go on to get some type of formal training, which a lot of times you don't see that as much. Do you think backyard wrestling's more when you started, was it desire to become involved in the business now? It's more of like a daredevil. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm glad I'm not a backyard wrestler now because uh, – Seeing some of that stuff uh, that they do, I saw on TV, they sell that one tape. I'm um, not to plug something else. But, uh, you know, the, the stuff they do now, I mean, that was brought up by ECW, you know, with their crazy, the hardcore, and, and a lot of people, you know, the hardcore fans, you know, got a, got the tapes of Japan, FMW, and stuff like that, and IWA, Big Japan, and, and they go out and do all that crazy stuff now. I mean, a big move when I used to backyard wrestle was taking a vertical suplex on the ground. I mean, that really hurt, so... <laughs> Um, you talked about formal training. What kind of formal training have you had? Uh, when I first started, I, I started at Larry Sharp's Monster Factory in Clementon, New Jersey. And uh, I was there for several months. And then I had an opportunity to go to Al Snow's in Lima, Ohio. And I went there, and the arrangement I had with Al Snow was... Uh, I could go like once a week, like most of the guys they had to live there as a dojo type thing. And what I would do is I'd go there like once a week, uh, every month for, I think I did it for about six or eight months. And I would go there and I would learn a little bit more. And, and, and like, I would just go around on some of the local shows and put over some of the, uh, the guys that were just starting, you know, cause I knew enough back then, uh, to do like just about opening match. So I could have like the opening match with a lot of the new guys. That's kind of how I started that. Um, what was your first professional match? Uh, my my first professional match was uh, it was either January or February of 1995. Uh, I wrestled under my name Tom Carter, and uh, I wrestled for Larry Sharp's Monster Factory. Uh, it was coming to New Jersey, and uh, it was against Mark the Shark Schrader. Yes, it was. First match I ever had was Mark Shark Schrader. Went out, I think we worked like eight to ten minutes in front of like three, four hundred people, and it was probably the best feeling I ever had. Now I knew then I wanted to wrestle, you know, keep on wrestling, you know, whatever, whatever happened, whatever happened. But yeah, it was an awesome experience. I, but from that point, I, I wrestled sporadically. I Sharp I just wrestled. I wrestled only like two more times with Larry Sharp. I wrestled in uh, February '95, and then I didn't wrestle till. I think it was June of 95, and then I went to Al Snow's in September of 95, that's when the whole, like, uh, record shoot gimmick came about, and uh, I started doing that out there, like, the end of 95, beginning of 96. How did you come up with the character? Uh, it's a funny story, because uh, me and D'Lo, we started together, and this one guy that used to wrestle, uh, that used to wrestle with us, we would go to him, we would go with him to some of the shows, and he was a really bad driver, he almost got us killed a couple times, like really, like he was a really bad driver, and uh, I, you guys probably never heard anything, he only wrestled for Larry Sharp a couple times, like twice, as a matter of fact, but his name, his wrestling name was Vinny Boombox, and so he started calling it, it was messed up, it was supposed to be Boombox or something like that, but uh, he was the reckless shoot, like, like D-Lo was in the car, and he was like, man, you're like a reckless shoot. And at the time, I was trying to figure out a name because I couldn't. Everybody was lightning something at the time, you know. Everybody was a huge Mark Rashard and Long, like myself too. But uh, and D'Lo came up with the name, and the kid only wrestled like twice in '94, and uh, he just didn't stay with the business. He wasn't really into it that much, and he kind of got out of it. And then like a year later, I was like, oh, I was thinking about using the name. And he was like, I don't care. I don't, I'm not wrestling anymore. And I was like, oh, okay. But then that was like I think the beginning of '95. But then the character I didn't start using till the end of '95, beginning of '96, because it took a little while to develop it. But D'Lo is the one that actually came up with the whole reckless shoot name. Uh, what were some major influences on your career? Uh, like once I got in the business, yeah. or before I got in the business? Well, uh, I 
I think when I was younger, I used to really like the heavyweight wrestlers. I used to be, well, that's hard. I used to be a big fan of like the World Warriors, but then I also used to like uh, Rock and Roll Express. I was a huge NWA, old old NWA fan. And uh, but then as I got older, I started appreciating more of the technical wrestlers, and uh, I really got into like the Kurt Hennings and uh, the Great Mudas and guys like that. I mean, I'm trying to uh, some of the names escape me at this time, but. I mean, there was a lot of talented guys. I mean, I remember loving the varsity club. I love that gimmick and, and their wrestling style. And uh, and once I got in the business, uh, I was highly motivated, motivated by it. like all the lightweight, junior weights, cruiser weights, whatever you call them, and, and uh, highly motivated by by Steve Regal. Uh, I loved his style of wrestling. And then when I was in Memphis, I got the opportunity to train with them and work with them, which was probably one of the best experiences I've probably had in wrestling today. Uh, you competed all over the United States on the independent scene, so what was probably the worst road trip you ever had? Well, it depends. Like, if you mean, like, a road trip, like, losing... I mean, there's so many different ways you can you can say. I, I mean, you're talking about a road trip where you lose money. You're talking about a road trip where, I mean, I just got no sleep. Or, I mean, it was pretty regular. When I was in Memphis, I was sleeping on floors for months, you know? So, I mean, it, I didn't really have, like, really bad road trips. I can remember a lot of road trips where I was just really tired. I mean, I remember when I was first starting and, I mean, spending, like, $250, $300 and only making you know, $25. Uh, I mean, if some people consider that hard, I mean, I mean that was hard, but pro I mean, I can think a lot of times I would leave like New Jersey and I would travel out to Michigan to do the show, to do a show on Friday. And then uh, I would drive through the night to, uh, to Boston to do a show and then drive back to Jersey to do a show on Sunday. So, I mean, a lot of times, uh, you know, and then I worked a job during the week. So it was really hard, but I, I I can't really, oh, you know what, probably Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico was pretty awful. <laughs> Puerto Rico was pretty awful. Like, the wrestling experience was really good, but the uh, but the actual, like, being in Puerto Rico, I've never been to a place like Puerto Rico. I tell people all the time that uh, if you imagine the dirtiest, scummiest place in, like, in the United States and multiply that by 10, that's probably one of the better places in in like Puerto Rico, but uh, as far as wrestling there, I really enjoyed wrestling there. But uh, it, it's like being there. I didn't like. I, I didn't like being there at all. I, I really wasn't comfortable being there. Who did you mainly travel with? Uh, I traveled quite a bit when I first started. There was a clique of five guys that we used to trap that I used to travel with, and uh, two of them are out of the business now. But it used to be Akita Chaos. He was from Monster Factory. Dave Keller, another guy I used to travel with, uh, backyard friend too. D'Lo Brown, Don Montoya, and myself. And uh, we all used to, you know, drive around together and call ourselves our own little clique and everything like that and all. And uh, we used to even have like a gay little symbol too. This was our symbol. And uh, it was like the three that were still wrestling and the two that were down. And uh, like we used to do a lot of that stuff. But uh, when I first traveled, it was with a lot of those guys. And then uh, after different guys moved on and got out, I... I I traveled probably the most with Don Montoya. Traveled the most with him, like everywhere. And he had a lot of mindset, like me. Like he was really determined to get his name out on the independence. And we used to like. I, I can remember the first year that I wrestled. I I think I made like seven or eight hundred dollars, and I spent over six thousand dollars on wrestling. And you know, it, it's kind of rough because a lot of times guys talk about paying their dues and this that, and the other thing. And I'm like, man, you know, like you don't know what paying your dues is if you wrestle around the corner from your house. <laughs> um, next question: What are some of your favorite opponents that you wrestled, worked with? Wow, um, I really enjoyed working uh, Don Montoya. He, there, are, there are very few guys that I could work with that I enjoyed working with as a baby face or a heel. And there were very few guys. And uh, Don Montoya was one. He was just phenomenal as a baby face or a heel. And we could have a good match if it was in front of Smart Marks, or we could have a good match in front of just kids. And, you know, we just changed the style. He was really, he was really up to date with, a, like, you know, he was really adept with a lot of different things. So I, I really enjoyed working with him. Uh, I loved working with Mike Quackenbush because uh, he was really into the Japanese and Mexican style. He wanted to learn so much too, and you know whatever we learned, we traded with each other. And I really enjoyed working with him. Uh, 
I loved working Steve Carino when he was on the Indies too, because he was another guy. He was he was either a great babyface or he was an awesome heel. And the biggest thing is, if I worked babyface, I wanted to work against a good heel. You know, sometimes there's guys who are, oh, I'm a heel, and all they do is just go out and tell the crowd to shut up. Steve was a great heel, and I loved working babyface as long as as long as he was the heel. Uh, there's countless other guys I had great matches with, but uh, there's a handful of guys that uh, that I think of now that I was like, man, I, I could have great matches with them. Like, even if I was taking it easy. And that's the, that's what I think of a lot of times. Um, what's your favorite match to date? When it sticks out in your mind. I think I was real lucky. And a lot of people ask me this question. I think I was real lucky because there was a period of time where every weekend I was wrestling uh, in a different territory. And I was wrestling some of the top guys in every territory. And I was having, I thought I was having really good matches with all those guys. To point out one match was not fair. I, I just I wrestled a lot of great guys, and it, to, to isolate one particular match, I mean, I, I couldn't really do that because I couldn't even think of one offhand. But I was lucky enough that I just gelled with a lot of guys that I worked with, and and we just we were able to work out a lot of great matches. And, and some of the matches that weren't probably the best, like technical matches or high flying matches, there were other elements in them that uh, that were just really good matches. Like I think of a match when I was doing NWA Canada one time, and I worked with this guy and. and uh, uh, Sean Brown, and uh, it was it was just a great match, and it, but it was a real simple match, you know. But the crowd was really into it. There's a lot of matches I wrestled where I wrestled, you know, all different types of styles. A lot of great guys I wrestled with. Um, Working so many different territories, you get injured over time. Uh, what was probably the worst injury you had? Uh, I've had I, I I've had quite a few concussions that put me out for a period of time. Um, I had a fracture in my leg. I got on one of your shows <laughs> uh, that had me out for, and it was ironic because it was right when I signed my WWF deal, and uh, and I fractured my leg. And Terry Taylor got uh, Terry Taylor jumped. She, he's the one that hired me in WWF, and then he went to back to WCW, and I fractured my leg, and I had to call him and tell him that I couldn't work. I didn't know they were doing something with me, but I had to call him and tell him. So I really thought I was going to lose my job, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, I mean, other than a lot of bumps and bruises, I'm constantly seeing the chiropractor. I'm pushing to a lot of people massage therapy. I go get a lot of massage therapy to work out a lot of stress in the neck and the back. But uh, other than that, I think I've been pretty lucky so far. I mean, I'll probably have a lot of brain damage when I'm older, you know, and I probably won't be able to walk. But I try to stretch as much as I can and, you know, and work out as much as I can and just try to maintain this healthy of a lifestyle besides wrestling. <laughs> Been on the road a lot. What was probably one of the greatest roads you ever saw pulled on somebody or pulled on something? Uh, I, I wasn't really so much, I wasn't really that much of a river when it came to a lot of things. Uh, I got a reputation for just being a straight shooter and telling people what I think and stuff. And But uh, I, I think of some like funny little things that I, that we've done in a bunch of different places. I mean, being on the road a lot, you come up with so many millions of stories, but I can remember we were out in Pittsburgh, and there's this one guy out in Pittsburgh, and it's the now infamous Dynamite Dean spot. This is guy that wrestled out in Pittsburgh, and uh, and he was working a match with Lord Zoltan, and uh, it was we were watching the tape of it, and the guy was telling us how funny it was, Drew Lazario, and we watched this guy, and he did like this spot where he, you know, they were the guy was firing up for his comeback, and I guess he jumped to the second rope, and the guy was supposed to be there to catch him for a twisting cross body, and. But the guy wasn't there. The guy was still laying on the ground, and he jumped, and he twisted around, and he landed on the ground, and then he scurried over to Zoltan and covered him. And Zoltan kicked down on the toe, and the crowd popped. Like, the crowd never even knew. We thought it was the funniest thing. So Don and and, uh, and Mike were working a show that I was at ringside with them, and they ripped me by doing the spot to me, and I didn't even know it was coming. And I fell down laughing. I couldn't get up laughing. And so a couple weeks later, uh, when we were in Pittsburgh, uh, I told I told Romeo uh, Romeo Valentino to do it to Montoya. I explained the whole spot, and they did it to Montoya. And I just thought it was the funniest thing because Montoya didn't expect it because he he was expecting me to rip him, but the, he didn't expect Romeo to rip him. And I had Romeo rip him when he did it. It was just the funniest thing because even when you watch the tape, you can see him laughing the whole time. You just can't you couldn't stop laughing. And the most amazing thing about the spot is nobody ever nobody ever catches it. Like as bad as it is, no one ever like says like. Oh, you messed up or anything like that. Like, he still scurried over and covered him and he kicked out and the crowd still popped. And that was what was the more. I think those people can't fathom that the, the spot is that dumb that people can't fathom it. But, but that was probably one of the. That's one of the recent rigs that I can think of that was really hilarious. But I never really did anything like really mean or nasty. You hear about a lot of people doing like really mean, disgusting, nasty things. I never really did anything like that. I did everything I did, I just did it out of fun and stuff.
<laughs> What's your outlook on the independence? Uh, there's a lot of ways I look at the independence. Now, with a lot of the companies being pretty messed up the way they are, uh, as far as the major companies, it could be the surge on the independence that, that's needed. Uh, that right now, there were, up until recently, there was so much wrestling on TV that uh, nobody came to the independence. The, the independence wasn't supported the way it used to be. But on the flip side of it is, is that, like, everybody and their mother has a company now, and everybody and their mother that knows nothing about wrestling is training people, and they're putting out, you know, they're putting out the, they're putting out students that know nothing about wrestling, and wrestling shows that know nothing about wrestling. And uh, it, the business, I think, is pretty bad in that respect now. Uh, there's a lot of guys that, you know, that, that make, there's just some guys that can flip and buy, and there's some guys that can go through tables or Bob Wire or whatever, but there's very few guys that can actually wrestle anymore. Uh, it used to be an art to be able to get into some, get in the ring with somebody not as good as you and bring them up to your level and have a good match with them or make them have a good match or, you know, work to have them have a good match. Uh, you can think of, uh, like, when people talk about how great Shawn Michaels was, he was able to elevate. I mean, Shawn Michaels could make a room look good, no matter what anybody said about his attitude. And, uh, anymore there's so many kids now that all they know how to do is make themselves look good and they don't know how to work with people anymore and uh, i think that's another thing that's hurt in wrestling i think that's another thing and everything now i think looks so choreographed that it's that it's not good either it, it looks so choreographed that, that people believe that it's that it's fake anymore because it looks so bad because they're they're the blind leading the blind right now what do you think the best decision you ever made in wrestling is? Uh, that's the decision I think I made in wrestling. To keep pursuing wrestling. Um, probably to never give up on wrestling, even even though, you know, uh, I may have not dealt the best cards, and uh, a lot of people, you know, uh, say I don't kiss enough ass or whatever to get places. Um, I think I've been lucky that I've been able to continue wrestling. Uh, and that I chose to continue wrestling. Uh, I love wrestling. I, I, that's why I do it. I did. I tell people all the time. I didn't get into wrestling because I wanted to have an action figure of myself or to see myself on a video game. I wrestled because I love wrestling, and, and I used to just wrestle once a month at Larry Sharp's. And then when I started getting more bookings and things started happening, I just went with the flow. I I never had aspirations to be in the WWF or WCW. The only thing I ever really wanted to do was go and wrestle in Japan after I saw a lot of Japanese wrestling. And uh, other than that, I just I just been, I just wanted to wrestle. What's your biggest regret? My biggest regret is probably sounds silly, is that. Um, a lot of times people tell me that uh, if I kissed a little more ass, or if I wasn't afraid to stick a needle in my ass, that I would probably have a job. And in some ways, I regret that wrestling's like that, because it used to be that it didn't, it, it mattered more about your talent. And there's, the things that I regret is, you know, sometimes that maybe I don't make the certain sacrifices, I don't kiss the right ass, and, and, uh, and you know, I don't do steroids to get bigger. Uh, Sometimes I feel like that. Sometimes, but then other times I, I'm happy. I'm proud of what I've done and where I've gone in the sport. And if you want to call it a sport, uh, where I've gone. So it, it's a constant battle. Uh, wrestling really, I, I mean, like any job, probably really has its tolls on everyone. Uh, what memories do you have of working for the WWF? Uh, the first arc match I ever did was against Steve Carino. Uh, it was at State College, and. I've never in my life. We've got to run out of time. No, no, no. I never in my life uh, when D'Lo would tell me how he used to wrestle and how explain to me the crowd. You know, like hearing the crowd and feeling in your chest. Uh, I used to be a big raver and all. I used to go to the clubs and you feel the the base like standing right near a thing, feeling your chest like your whole body's rumbling. And that's probably the closest thing I've been able to describe of being in the middle of a wrestling ring in front of 20,000 people, having everyone face you and look at you and roar for something that you do. It's probably one of the most amazing feelings that I've ever felt in my life. And uh, it was probably it was probably one of the best feelings I've ever felt in my life. And uh, that was probably one of the fondest memories I had at the WWF. Uh, one of the bad memories I had at the WWF is probably being in Memphis and uh, constantly running into brick walls, uh, 
you know, everybody would say, why aren't you up here? Why aren't you there? Why aren't you there? You know, and then just constantly running to a brick wall. It's just really frustrating. And, uh, that, I mean, there, there was a lot of good things I, you know, that I took with me. And there was a lot of bad things too. But it's, it's like that with everything. But I would probably say that was the most amazing. I tell people, if you ever, you know, go to do a dark match or work a, you know, show like that, it was, it was an amazing feeling. Like, you think being in front of, I think up until that point, I had been in front of the biggest crowd I've been in front of is like between two and three thousand. And uh, I wrestled in front of, I think Penn State was 16 or 17,000 maybe. And Memphis was like 20,000. And uh, it was just an amazing feeling. It, it was just an incredible feeling. It makes it all, you just don't feel any pain and all. I know some of those guys can go up and do the craziest stuff because it's such an adrenaline rush. Um, where did you get the moniker King of the <laughs> This is a funny story because back, it actually started when I was doing the East Coast Invasion uh, angle out in Michigan. And Dave Prazak was introducing us as we came out. And uh, he referred to Don Montoya as, I think, the best big man in wrestling, best super heavyweight something. Uh, Lance Diamond came out, now Simon Diamond, referred to him as the best technical wrestler in wrestling, to independent wrestling, I think was what he termed it. And uh, when I came out, he referred to me as the king of the independents. And I guess he started pushing it. And after he started saying it, uh, the sheets got a hold of it, and other people started saying it. And before I knew it, like everywhere, I was known as the king of independents. And the reputation, I think, a lot of guys misconstrued the reputation. I could be wrong, but the way I understood it is it was because in one month, I was wrestling seven, eight, nine different states in one month. I mean, I could be in Jersey one day. I was in Florida another day. I was in California the next day. I was traveling all over the country on my own expense. And uh, I think I was known as King of the Independence because I traveled so much. A lot of guys on the Independence got really, really jealous. Uh, I was really lucky because I was in a region of the country where I was lucky enough to get a lot of press. And uh, I think it turned into King of the Independence being the number one independent or the best independent. And then it became a big feud with a lot of guys all over. It just, it just, it actually, what I thought was a, like a little gimmick we were just doing in one place turned into this big explosion. And uh, it wound up being a lot more grief than it was worth because uh, it just it just put a lot of stress on myself. It put a lot of stress on a lot of the locker rooms that I walked in. A lot of guys were just like, who does this guy think he is? He thinks he's the best, you know? And, and it was kind of like one of those things that, you know, started and steamrolled and, and it kind of went with it. And now everybody and their mother's trying to challenge it or everybody and their mother's trying to say they're the next one or the best one. And I actually even heard at one time Sabu was referred to as the King of the Independence at one time too. So I, I don't really know, but it, it, it was one of those things that kind of snowballed. Man. I always tell Dave Prasak about it. I thought it was pretty funny how he started and it just kind of snowballed. And uh, he probably doesn't even remember the story. But uh, it was one of those things where it turned into being more grief than it was worth, especially with just a lot of people. A lot of guys just got so jealous of it over it. And, and, and what I was more offended than anything is because obviously people looked at me in a certain light because the way I conducted myself outside and inside the locker room and uh, in the ring around the place, the way I treated, the way I just was my whole demeanor. And I thought, of anything, a lot of the guys that were jealous were the guys that never really did anything, and they were mad. And I thought, if anything, they could learn by example, because these people were putting them on this pedestal saying, wow, this is the guy that we're looking at, you know, this is one of the guys who other guys would, would say, like, okay, we got to elevate ourselves up to that, instead of crying and complaining that they're not getting any press, or they're not doing anything. And they wrestle, like, five minutes from their house, once a month, you know, in their own backyard. They never really do anything. And it, it was just really frustrating to deal with a lot of people, you know, with, with that, a lot of that. It, it, it gave me a lot more grief than I wanted. Um, what goals do you have in wrestling right now? The only goal I ever really had when I got into wrestling was to go to Japan. And that's the only goal I've really maintained. That I, I mean, I, obviously, I would like to foresee myself uh, cashing a paycheck from a major company, you know, on a weekly basis and getting a nice pay-per-view check, uh, you know, but... Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen. I would like to think it's going to happen. I would like to hold a late heavyweight or cruiserweight or junior heavyweight strap in a major company one day. Uh, that would, you know, would be really nice. Uh, but my main goal was really to wrestle in Japan. What do you like to say to your fans? The sun. Uh, thanks for supporting everything I've done for the past five, almost six years now. That's it. Thank you.